this, even if they can't attend today. Um, so from my perspective, obviously, it's uh, it's literally a year ago that the uh, the government announced uh, the ambition for England for England to be smoke free by 2030 in the green paper, um, which was entitled in advancing our health prevention in the 2020s. Uh, that also committed to considering the APPG's recommendation for a polluter pays approach to funding tobacco control. Uh, I suspect we may not get the answers to some of those issues today, but, but we will continue to press on those particular uh, issues. I'm delighted, obviously, that, that uh, Joe Churchill, the Public Health Minister, is able to be here on the anniversary of the publication of the Green Paper. I'd like to thank her personally for her continued support for the agenda that we've been pushing forward on uh, for many years. And she has shown her uh, resolution, I think it's fair to say, that when the reshuffle was going on in February, um, despite the fact that when ministers are uh, on tenterhooks as to whether they will continue in their jobs or not, uh, she actually visited a uh, a maternity service in Greater Manchester, uh, which is directly uh, supporting women and their partners to quit smoking. So that demonstrates, I think, uh, quite clearly the uh, support that she's been giving. Now, COVID-19 uh, has understandably slowed progress on next steps. And we, are, we all understand that this has had the biggest impact on the health agenda uh, for the last six months or so. But following the consultation on the on the prevention green paper, uh, we want to see achieving the smoke free smoke free 2030 ambition, and therefore any support that we can give as an all party group uh, will be there to help the government, <clears throat> both in its levelling up agenda, and supporting the health and economic recovery. Now we are um, announcing our endorsement of the today of the roadmap to a smoke free. 2030, which sets out measures uh, necessary to achieve this worthy ambition. One of the key concerns that I've always had uh, is, apart from encouraging people who smoke to give up smoking, is to encourage children not to start. Uh, and the, the reality is that over 100,000 children are, are estimated to have taken up smoking since the publication of the Green Paper a year ago. More than two thirds of those will become regular smokers uh, on a daily basis, which which makes um, uh, the action that we need to deliver on this agenda all the more urgent. Once someone has become addicted to cigarettes, it's very, very hard for them to give up. And many people I know during this pandemic have either quit smoking or attempted to quit smoking. Uh, but once you're, you're addicted, it's very difficult to give up. So it's far more important than anything else that we literally stop people from starting to smoke, particularly when they're young. Now, um, I, we're sorry that Councillor Ian Hudspeth, Chairman of the LGA Community Wellbeing Board, is not able to join us today, uh, having been taken ill two weeks ago. Um, I, I'm pleased to hear that he's recovering well and expected to be back at work next week. Uh, I, and I think on behalf of the All Party Group, I'd like to thank Ian for his support for the work and recognise the target set out in his local authority of Oxfordshire for the country to be smoke free by not 2030, but 2025. That's what I like, ambition uh, and targets. Um, so uh, from that perspective, that sets the agenda, I think, for today. Um, an apology from me, uh, particularly uh, to to Joe, uh, in that, uh, unfortunately, I'm also a member of the Housing, Communities and Local Government Select Committee, and we are um, we are grilling the Secretary of State this morning from 9.30 onwards. So I'll have to drop out uh, uh, before... Uh, the end of uh, the minister's speech, but my apologies for that um, in order to that I'm in there in plenty of time. But I've got to hand over, I think, to Lord Faulkner, who's going to uh, chair the rest of the the sessions. Uh, so um, I'm going to um, hand over to uh, Sue Mountain, who's 
an ex-smoker and survivor of smoking related cancer she's going to give her us her perspective on the importance of preventative sue hi as you said i am an ex-smoker <coughs> and a cancer survivor i was using start smoking at school as a child um, I, <coughs> sorry i've had my throat isn't always good um, it was easy to start smoking at school because I did without dinners. I used my dinner money to buy cigarettes, pinch the odd cigarette off my mum. I walked to school, so it was quite easy for me to start smoking. And back then, they sold cigarettes singly with a match. So, and I never realised when I was young how addicted it was and how dangerous. My, my heroes, Audrey Hepburn and Olivia Newton-John, God, I looked up to them. And what's the image you get of them? The cigarettes, the what's up stores, she just looks sexy, she's got a cigarette. To me, that's how I was brought up, with cigarettes being acceptable. Um, I tried quitting. Believe you me, unless you're a smoker, you don't understand. I tried quitting loads of times when I felt pregnant and I just didn't want to do it. Eventually, um, I got a hope's voice and I went to the doctor and I was diagnosed with cancer of the larynx. And believe it or not, this is how addiction gets to you. As I was diagnosed, I walked out that hospital doors and guess what I went for? This cigarette. The cigarette that caused me cancer, but I was 50, 50 odd, I don't forget how old I was. That cigarette was my crutch. I needed that to calm me down. In my mind, that's how addiction gets to you. Mm. Anyway, I got me throat lasered and I did pack in smoking. And then I got it all clear. I was still addicted. And I'm being honest. I started smoking again because I thought it'll never hit me twice. Arrogant, but I wasn't arrogant, it was the addiction. I needed my cigarettes. I used them for social. I, I needed it for a crutch. Um, and anyway, sorry, I'm just letting me know because I don't want to jump. The cancer came back 2017. Um, it was more severe and I did need radiotherapy. But the thing that I want you to understand that you look at people with cancer and you look at them as the singular. It's not just them suffering from cancer. It's the family. And when I had to go through the radiotherapy, my family I had to go through it, my daughters, which didn't ask to be going through that. It was me that put them through it. It was the addiction that put me through it. I did quit smoking. Yes, and I never think of smoking now. I never, I always thought I would have to fight quitting every day of my life. But I don't. I'm fortunate. I have quit and I don't think of smoking. I'm now cancer free. But that doesn't mean that I don't live without the thought of cancer every day. Every six weeks, I still get the camera up my nose, down my throat, which is unpleasant. Um, and I'm always worried because of me smoking that cancer is going to come back to me lungs. You know, I am fortunate. I don't think it's fair that them tobacco companies are making huge profits from addiction that robs people, me, rob me in my life, my health. I don't think they should be let off. Drug dealers get put in prison. They should be paying towards what they have caused. It's not fair that the NHS has to foot the bills for smoking related illnesses. Now our councils have to fund stop smoking services, which I'm part of one of them at the minute. And it's great that fewer children smoke now than when I was young. But one child is one child too many. One child too many. As I said, it's easy to start to start smoking. So easy. You can always pinch that odd one off your pavement. But so, so hard 
to stop. More for the moan about the government ambition to have a smoke free generation by 2030. But words on the own are not enough. It's not enough. Action is, is what we need. We want to prevent future generations getting cancer like me. I don't want people to go through what I've gone through, not just me, my family. I'm, a, I'm lucky I'm a survivor, but there's many that aren't survivors. It's about time the government firmly commit to action to make this smoke-free 2030 a reality. That's me finished. Well, thank you, Sue, for um, those words, and I think that re reflects what we're what we're campaigning for very effectively. And uh, best wishes for your continued recovery. I think uh, yeah, that's uh, what we have to say. Uh, we now come to Alex Norris, MP, who's the Shadow Public Health Minister, uh, who's going to give us some reflections on the prevention agenda. Alex. Thanks, Bob, and, and thanks everybody for having me. Um, and thank you, Susan, for your personal testimony. You know, I, I reflected a lot on my own smoking recovery when you talked about it, and, and I, I could relate to so much about it. Like lots of people uh, in my community, like lots of people perhaps in the room, I started as, as, a, as a child, frankly, when I'd, I'd have been, what, 13 or 14, and it was a long old road, and, you know, and it's never quite finished. And it's something that you live with every day and, and you have to work with every day. And But well, we appreciate it, I think, You've set a really important tone for for the, the meeting and, and the context in which we meet. Um, I'm I'm Labour's shadow public health lead. Um, this you know this is a, a topic that is personally important to me. It's exceptionally important to to our country. Uh, you know, Joe Joe and I. You know, obviously I'm speaking just before Joe, but Joe and I collaborate on many issues. And this is not. I think I don't think this is this is politically contested space at all. And I think this is something that we all as a nation have a vested interest in. Um, and I think that the, the, the country and, and colleagues would want to see uh, their, their political leaders coming together and working by consensus to get this get this done. And that's very much the spirit with which uh, I join you today. Uh, I'm a member of parliament in Nottingham. Uh, my, the, my, my community, my city in general, but my certainly my part of Nottingham is one of the most challenged parts of the country. Um, so it means that when it comes to whatever the 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 public health issue, we generally tend to be at the, the bottom of the league tables for it. Um, and, you know, that's not something we're proud of in the slightest, but it is the reality. And, and therefore, it gives me that, again, a bit more lived experience about what effective public health is. And it's why I was uh, so, so pleased and so proud to be to uh, be given the job as Labour's public health lead. Because what I always say, I say in every meeting, and, and I know looking around the, the room, uh, people have heard me say this before. Um, when it comes to public health interventions, if they work in Nottingham, they will work everywhere. And I very much come in that spirit. Uh, I take a very belt and braces approach to public health. I think we need strong and clear messages. I think you need very, you need evidence backed interventions, obviously well resourced. Um, and, and that's, and that's very much the way, the way I look at it. I'm, you know, I'm not a purist, frankly. I, I take a very much a what works uh, model to it. And certainly within smoking cessation, we actually do have, you know, the evidence base is very good in terms of what what works. So in, for, for me, it was a diversionary intervention uh, in, into into vaping that's helped me not only change my smoking behaviours, but reduce and shortly, hopefully to, to not at all, uh, but also broader smoking cessation interventions, uh, which um, to which move people and transition people more quickly. Again, in Nottingham, been very effective. And, and that's what, what, what we're, we're, we're seeking to build on. We can't have a conversation without talking about COVID, but what COVID's told us is, you know, when you have um, a really, really challenging issue around respir respiratory health, well, smoking's a bad thing. And again, that's, that's, that means that the, the, uh, the impact on communities like mine is greater as a result. So again, hopefully this, is, this has helped lots of people and certainly us as, um, as, as, as leaders hold up that mirror to say, okay, this is not a good thing. And we know that lots and lots of people have stopped smoking during lockdown. Um, again, a, a significant part for, for me and, and talking to my friends as well, because, well, you're with your wife every day, so you're better. Otherwise, you're in trouble. And, and, if, that's, and if that's your reason, and again, that certainly is a significant motivating factor for me, uh, then OK, you, that, that's good. And we need to consolidate that. We need to wrap our, our arms around those people and make sure that as lockdown changes and you think, well, we're going back for a pint. And then I fall back in, you know, after a couple of pints, I fall back into my old behaviours. OK, well, let's make sure we don't do that. And what can we do to do so? Um, 
I'm a strong advocate and a big believer in um, in the polluter pays model. Um, you know, and again, this isn't a time for partisan politics, but local authorities are going to struggle coming out of COVID. And we can, the, you you can have a conversation, Bob, with the Secretary of State about the extent to which um, uh, local authorities' financial gaps will be met. So I will leave that to you because, frankly, he's probably more scared of you than me. Um, but please do have that conversation. But what we do know is that local authorities will be struggling coming out of COVID. Um, you know, if for nothing else than a loss of income in the car parks, loss of income at the leisure centres, there's going to be a lot of pressures. Uh, and we know that traditionally the public health grant has been something that's been squeezed. And we have, you know, I, I was for three years, I was my public health lead on, on Nottingham City Council. So I say this from, from a sinner, from a sinner's perspective. Uh, we None of us would want that to mean a diminution in smoking cessation services. That would be bad for all of us. That would be those. You know, those are, as I say, evidence-based interventions that save the public purse lots and lots of money, and more critically, save lives. So, a, a polluter pays model to make sure we we do still have those services at the level we've got today, but frankly, that we can build on, has to be a priority for all of us. And obviously, I'll be interested to hear hear Joe's reflections on that. Um, and then moving on to you know the, the broader, you know, we we do have if, if we sat here ten years ago, a smoking cessation conversation is very different now, Bob, um, and you know vaping. And the technology in general changes so quickly. So again, setting a regulatory framework. You know, I'm a left winger, Bob. So, so perhaps I, I'm, I'm perhaps more uh, progressive, more aggressive in that space than, than other uh, parliamentary colleagues might be. But a, a model, a, a market that is a high quality uh, one, that is one that you know drives up standards, drives up awareness, low on advertising or well, no on advertising. Of course, has to be a good thing. Um, you know, of course we. We're in a better situation than, say, the Americans. Our, our, our market is better regulated. But now, after Brexit, we will have a chance to set our own regulatory regime. So, again, we what, what regulatory regime do we do and, what, and what's the, the safest and, and the best one to protect everyone, but particularly young people, from harm? So I think there's a lot for us to go at, actually. I think there's a real opportunity for us um, in, in our country to, to be a world leader on this. As I say, I don't think it's politically contested space, so I hope it's something we can do by consensus. We know that you, Bob, and other colleagues through, through the APPG will be pushing us hard on this. Um, so I think, you know, now's a really exciting time to be reaffirming our commitment to smoke free by 2030. The work together to come with those, those interventions and to get it right, because we know whether it's in Nottingham or across the country, um, we will make, we will, we'll avoid extraordinary harm and we will change lives and we'll unleash potential. It's, 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 no, it's no smaller than that. And, and I'm looking forward to playing my part in that. OK, th thank you very much, Alex, for that contribution and your commitment. Um, and actually, I think one of the things I would say is that it does help in these positions if you have been on a, in a, a council and been involved in, in aspects of, of making this happen. So thank you for that. Uh, uh, I now introduce uh, the uh, Public Health Minister, Joe Churchill. Joe, over to you. Thanks, Bob. Um, so firstly, thank you for inviting me and um, thank you, Sue, for telling us about your journey. Um, for me, I am the granddaughter of two men who um, one died of emphysema, one died of lung cancer. Um, so smoking was something that happened in our family. Um, Neither of my parents smoked, but then one of my sisters started exactly the same as you and Alex at school um, for a plethora of reasons, you know. So first it was peer pressure, then it was weight, then it was just to, to fit in and so on. It's been a mm, getting on for a 50 year battle and it comes and it goes and different life pressures come and go. Um, I, like you, Sue, have done that cancer journey and seeing people have that ciggy outside the back of the oncology centre just because it's hard um, is a real challenge. And talking to hospital chief execs about making their premises really no smoking um, is, is also a challenge that we have in front of us. But if you like, um, as Alex put it so well, this is a job for all of us. It's not a job for um, 
it's not a job for party politics because we know we're doing the right thing by driving down smoking and particularly addressing some of the challenges like smoking in young people, making sure that those messages are clear. So thank you um, for inviting me and I'd like to congratulate you. Uh, Bob is one of the most dogged campaigners I know, particularly in this space, um, and his work is absolutely tireless. You couldn't be led by a better parliamentarian in my view. The contribution, um, not only of you, but of all those associated with you um, here today, um, towards the Prevention Green Paper consultation has been incredibly important. Uh, as was uh, mentioned, COVID has been a real challenge um, and remains at the forefront of our minds. And it, there's no doubt that the virus has upended um, all of our lives. But it's also focused us on improving the health of the nation and helping smokers quit for good. Because, you know, as both Sue and Alex have said, I'd love to meet Mrs. Norris, by the way, if that's what's frightened you into giving up smoking, we need to we need to sort her out and get more of her. Um, but I was particularly, um, you know, uh, interested in the analysis from ASH and UCL that found over a million people had um, stopped smoking since the start of the pandemic. Um, that's fantastic. And we've got to build on that momentum. Um, I found the age disparity in that work very interesting. Is it that younger people are more susceptible or more encouraged by the use of an app um, to giving up? Was it parental pressure? Was it the fact that their, um, their availability of cigarette purchase was less? Was it that their socialising is the stimulus? So, so that further work and to see whether young people actually sustain this as we begin to open up, I think is going to be really key. Listening to Sue, it was a real powerful reminder of how important this work is. Um, and, you know, the the delay on the green prevention green paper is um, largely due to COVID. However, the department is working hard to make sure that we publish the plans and our response um, as soon as we can. The Green Paper consultation sought views around those extra funding mechanisms to support cessation. We have one of the highest rates of tobacco tax in the world and we will continue to work. You have my commitment that we'll continue to work with um, Treasury to explore further funding opportunities for taxation of tobacco. We continue to address harms um, through the existing com uh, commitments in the tobacco control um, plan and the NHS long term plan commitment, ensuring that smokers who are admitted to hospital are um, offered support to stop smoking. And we're making progress um, by the figures last week at 13.9, but where where the effect of COVID, where the effect of lockdown, wh where the societal um, challenges have actually helped drive that number down. Whilst it's a record low, I am really, really keen that we're not complacent and we don't see that number creep because we know that smoking cessation rates remain high, as Alex said, in disadvantaged areas like he represents. Um, and despite the local success of some first rate services, and I was really impressed by Tameside Hospital, the smoking cessation midwife was um, brilliant at, and actually for me, what I loved about it was it was, it was a bit of a bog off offer because you've got mum, you've got baby, and invariably you got a partner because the whole program was about having somebody supporting you through the journey. And that was usually either um, their um, actual, you know, dad or their partner, but it was very often mum or somebody who, as Sue said, um, had also been a smoker in the house and everybody trying to make the environment healthier for baby was was a really, really great program because we know that generally rates in pregnancy and it's a particular interest have remained stubbornly high um, and everyone 
deserves a chance of a long and healthy life. And that begins when you're in your mum's tum. So I am really, really keen on the levelling up agenda because actually understanding the correlation between infant mortality and um, smoking in pregnancy um, is something that I would like to I would like to actually get um, get more understanding of and actually target uh, more precisely. Um, I don't know whether I will have time, but I would be really interested in hearing Dr. Langley's comments in this space later on. As we move towards um, 2030 and smoke free, building on the good work that's already in place, I believe we need to be flexible and we need to be innovative and that we have um, a sustainable framework in place to deliver a smoke-free society, but that these things are long-term in their ambition. We're really interested um, in the in DH um, in stakeholders' views on improvements to the design and delivery of cessation services, the role that new technologies um, to help people quit might have. Although internationally the UK does have. Um, a reputation for tough tobacco control legislation. Is the regular, current regulatory framework enough? And as Alex said, maybe there are opportunities we should be looking at to seize. I also have um, another interest. We're focusing very much on the legal um, today. There is a lot of smoking that goes on in deprived communities, in my experience, from being um, a cabinet member and on a health and well-being board before I went to Parliament. Um, and if you're representing a deprived community, both um, illegal tobaccos, which tend to be smoked without a filter um, and so on, roll-ups, uh, and then obviously other uh, substances that may be smoked, um, making sure that messaging about smoking, about overall well-being, how we're helping people develop healthy lifestyles, I think is really important. So I'm really looking forward to the um, hearing the other contributions. Um, and I want to assure you that I'm keen to work with you all towards that ambition of 2030 and a smoke-free future. Joe, I'm taking over as chair now, so I'd like to say thank you very much indeed for that excellent contribution. Um, I'd also like to say thank you to Alex as well. I haven't met either of you in the, par in, in the past, so it's a pleasure to be with you both virtually today. Um, we have been fortunate in the all-party group over the years of having generally a cross-party consensus on what we're trying to achieve, and you both demonstrated that really well today. Um, I have a number of colleagues on the call today who were part of the uh, debate in the Lords on Monday on the Business and Planning Bill, which didn't go exactly as uh, most of us wanted it to, but it was, it was it was better than it could have been. And uh, we did at least get a clause in the bill which related to uh, uh, issuing of licenses um, and, uh, and smoke-free areas outside pubs. Um, and to my colleagues who are on this court, I'd like to say thank you very much indeed for the part you played in this. You may want to come in on the Q&A uh, a little bit later on. Our next speaker is the Director of Public Affairs of Sanofi, Henry Featherston. Uh, Sanofi is a worldwide company with thousands of employees who have got a fantastic record in medical research. And I'm certainly looking forward to hearing what Henry's got to say. Over to you. Thank you very much. I did have some slides and I don't know whether I'm supposed to be sharing them or someone else is supposed to be sharing them. That's an issue, I think, for... Um, Henry, we can share the link Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's how we call it. Because it, it's, yeah, there's some boring economic concepts to, uh, to, 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 to bore you with. Let me introduce myself while we're trying to get the, um, the, the slides up. Um, so my name's Henry. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a doctor by training, uh, but I'm now a chief lobbyist for a pharmaceutical company. And what I'm doing here is I'm going to share with you um, some thinking from a recent master's of mine into controlling the power of um, um, uh, monopoly uh, providers in pharmaceutical markets and how we can perhaps uh, apply this uh, into tobacco markets and um, uh, raise some money for the spoke three ambition. So if you can click through on to the next slide, please. So it's uh, an economics uh, 101. 
Uh, and so there, in, in general, there, if you, you look at markets, and this is a, a very big uh, profitable market, uh, the tobacco market, uh, there are four types of ways that you get market failure. The ones we're interested in are mainly on the right hand side here. So uh, externalities, so those goods and bads that you have in markets that aren't really counted for in the, in, in the pricing mechanism. Uh, and uh, it turns out about 10 years ago uh, in a previous life when I was at um, Policy Exchange, we had an idea of, we did some analysis and it, it turns out although tobacco taxes were quite high in the UK, they weren't high enough for, to count for all those goods and bads and mainly bads uh, that, that tobacco brought on our, our society. And as a result, the government introduced quite a shock price increase into the um, uh, tobacco tax regime. What we're interested in today is market power and monopoly power uh, in um, tobacco markets, which is what we're seeing more and more. And those four little things in the blue box underneath are the four theoretical ways you control market power uh, in a, a monopoly type market. So you have rate of rate return regulation, which is largely seen in utility markets. We've got private utility markets in the UK. Um, and price setting, that's a, a real, uh, a, another function of uh, rate of return regulation. Cost effective analysis. So in pharmaceutical markets, that's with NICE. So NICE looks at the majority of uh, medicines. And also this thing called value-based pricing. You try and work out what the societal value is of these, uh, um, whatever you're selling. Very complicated, very cumbersome and has its own problems. Um, but what I want to talk to you today is that about those top two. So um, pharmaceutical markets have um, monopoly power and they have monopoly power, not because firms are acting badly, but because um, pharmaceuticals are granted um, uh, patent protection for the first 10, 20 years, 10 years of, uh, of their life. And that's an opportunity to, um, you effectively gives you a monopoly position for a particular uh, treatment. Um, and that's controlled in the UK and the UK are experts in this and have been for many years through a thing called the Pharmaceutical Price Regulation Scheme uh, that only uh, people like me really know anything about. Um, and uh, what I want to talk to you today, this might be a, a way for to apply this type of um, uh, regulatory mechanism, try and raise some money to deliver the um, uh, smoke free ambition for 2030. So if we click through to the next slide. Has that gone through or is there just a delay? Sorry, can you click through to the next slide? Is that? There we go. Perfect. OK, so just want to give um, a few macro things, boring things about the way that um, the, the, the PPRS uh, works. And it was introduced like conveniently because um, what you were seeing is pharmaceutical companies were doing lots of repeated small price increases over time. And that's a classic sort of uh, uh, experience of what you see in uh, market power. Um, so it's now called the, 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 the VPAS. It's been around for ages, since the 1950s, 1960s. OK, it's renegotiated every five years. And so over this time, we've seen this very, very sophisticated system where you see potential loopholes or any gaming uh, by uh, alleged gaming by pharmaceutical um, uh, companies in the way that they uh, operate things have been closed. So we've got this highly evolved, very, very effective system. Um, but in pharmaceutical markets, especially in the UK, it's a quite delicate balance for the Department of Health to control public expenditure, which is what they want to do, but also allow um, a profitable and successful pharmaceutical industry, which is quite important when you want to try and uh, stimulate research into vaccines and, uh, and things, uh, and also um, not stifle uh, the progress and innovation. So um, in the UK, it's had statutory authority, and that's my, my mistake there, it's actually had statutory authority since 1999, uh, and there are two broad uh, schemes that companies can enter. So pharmaceutical companies can elect to go into this voluntary, non-contractual scheme where the only way that you can complain is dispute resolution. So no court cases, no challenges, nothing. Very simple scheme, all written down, highly complex, but very, very clear. Or companies can elect to go into a statutory scheme where there is a consultation on the changes to the regulations every five years, not a negotiation. So if you're in the voluntary scheme, you get to sort of negotiate industry versus the government every five years. Um, whereas the statutory scheme is slightly more onerous. Um, I think it's the thing that's worth pointing out from my point of view, and perhaps from the way it might apply to the smoke-free legislation of what you're trying to do in tobacco markets, it creates a huge focus for industry. Lobbying activity, normal activities are suspended in the year pre the negotiation and the year post the negotiation, 
which may or may not be um, a useful way to sort of uh, divert uh, firms attention. And in terms of the uh, money raised, uh, these are the most official uh, ABPI figures. So three billion raised over a five year period. And that spans two different schemes. So not be sort of uh, like with like uh, of three billion, three billion direct cash return to HM Treasury on sales of branded medicines of about 8.5 to 9 billion per year. Um, the total spend is, 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 is a lot different because the scheme only applies to branded medicines and certain types of branded medicines. Uh, and that money, there's a, site, a soft hypothecation of the money. So the money goes back to healthcare. OK, it doesn't go back to pharmaceuticals, goes back to healthcare, goes into the general spend for NHS England spend, whatever it thinks of. Then there's also a spend through to the devolved administra administrations. Goes to, some goes to Wales, some goes to Scotland. And the Scots for themselves, they play a little bit of politics with this and they fund a new medicines fund for this. So they use their, their rebate and they fund uh, new medicines. So if we click on to the next scheme, just a little bit more detail of actually how it works in practice. Sorry, Vicky, can you click through, please? Uh, hopefully that should be coming up. Oh, sorry, it's probably just a play on my... Um, internet so there are effectively um three three big parts three big elements of the scheme uh, one's not relevant here and that's how you promote access and uptake and that's not something we particularly want to apply to farm, uh, to uh, tobacco markets um but there are two important things of, uh, here in terms of this a company profit cap and the product price control um so the way that this company profit cap works and this is a way to make sure that you don't get super normal profits from the monopoly position it's assessed by an annual financial return, okay? And in effect, it's a set of audited accounts, special set of audited accounts, because there are very sort of detailed rules in the scheme of how, how it operates, that are signed off both by the financial director uh, and uh, the auditors uh, and the managing director of the company. So there's a level of accountability there. Um, typically, so the last published uh, numbers were about there were 31 annual financial returns in 2011. That was in the last uh, report to Parliament in 14. Uh, and small companies are exempted. So if you're only a small company with one product, it could be quite onerous. But for big, profitable companies, this is an extra administrative burden uh, and you get quite a lot of uh, information about them. And the way the profit cap is assessed, there are two ways you can assess the profit cap. You can either have the return on sales which is effectively you're allowed a 6% profit on sales, or you can allow a return on capital of 21%. That 21% figure was set in the, uh, in the 1990s, actually, uh, and a basis for the way that the average FTSE 5, profitability of the average FTSE uh, 500 company might be a little bit di uh, different now. Um, that third bullet point that I've got there about this uh, very uh, obscure thing called the average Johnson effect, so it's, a, it's just a, it's a watch out. So if you are setting a return on capital, quite a favourable return on capital um, uh, target, you might have companies co-locate a lot of their headquarters staff uh, and a lot of their um, uh, back office functions in the UK uh, just because of the offset. Uh, from an economic perspective, that's an inefficient use of resources because there might be other ways in other markets that they can do that. But that's just a capital, it's a well-recognised um, uh, phenomenon. Um, but then this annual financial return is assessed quite thoroughly by the department and you've got allowable expenses. And the important about this is your allowable expenses, but also controllable expenses for marketing. OK, because what the, the department is trying to do is try and make sure that the, um, there's not lots of reps bothering doctors uh, trying to push particular uh, products. Um, so you're controlling the marketing spend. You're allowing information precision and your information precision in terms of um, disease awareness uh, campaigns and then research and development. So you're allowing quite an offset to encourage innovation and research into pharmaceuticals. Uh, and then the price control mechanism. So uh, when you see sort of utilities uh, and the same with pharmaceuticals, you need the profit cap and the price control alongside each other. Um, we do have the pharmaceutical industry does have freedom of list pricing. But list pricing is, in effect, not really important in terms of pharmaceutical markets anymore because there's quite a lot of uh, discounting and confidential discounting around nice appraisals. So although we think we've got and we say that there's freedom of pricing in pharmaceutical markets, there isn't. So all uh, prices have to be approved by the department or, as we're seeing now, the majority of medicines go through nice and they're assessed cost effective by nice. Um, but the way that the early part of the scheme actually controlled prices very, very effectively um, was actually introducing mandatory price cuts 
to the list price of pharmaceuticals every five years. So in there you'll see 2005, a 7% cut, uh, an effective 5% cut in 2009, because that was staggered over a number of years. Um, but what we've seen since the uh, early um, uh, 2000s, and, it, and uh, the scheme has progressed over the last five, uh, 10 to 15 years or so, is that you've seen this pr list price cut replaced with cash payments to the department. Uh, and that's because you see quite a lot of discounting in hospital uh, markets and hospitals you, where you see most of the innovation in terms of pharmaceuticals over the last 10 years in, in oncology and in immune, immunology um, has been in, used in hospital medicines the West where you get discounting. So we now have a scheme, it's called the VPAS, where we have a cap and rebate scheme where the total cost of the branded medicines bill is fixed anything, any spend above that, um, you get a rebate uh, to the department. That might not be the sort of scheme that we'd want in, 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 in tobacco, uh, but just to show you how the scheme has, evo has evolved, okay, and it's been very effective, uh, the way it's evolved, and it's been the way it's been able to control the prices of it. Let's do just on the last uh, slide, uh, very quickly, um, how might you make this work? Um, you need some primary legislation. You don't need a lot. There's only 10 paragraphs in the NHS Act uh, 2006 to set the whole scheme up, both the statutory scheme, which is done by secondary legislation, and the uh, voluntary scheme. Um, what are the things that you would really want to do here? This an annual financial return to the Department of Health. Um, very, very effective. Very effective in terms of monitoring. So in terms of the concentration of the uh, tobacco markets, you're only going to need an extra three uh, or four annual financial returns a, uh, a year to come through. Um, how much profit do you want to allow the tobacco industry to have? Um, discuss that one to the minister. Um, uh, what are the important elements about this? It's about monitoring, actually. It's about monitoring and publishing aggregate spend. This was an important finding from the Health Select Committee in the way that they uh, assessed the PPRS many years ago. But in terms of marketing spend and sales spend, a really effective uh, mechanism. How might you do price control? Um, utility style can be any ways but I think uh, if you're going to have the department sitting uh, and having these financial returns it may say, make sense for them to be the price regulator you'd probably want to think about a maximum price and a minimum price don't think we want to encourage any discounting uh, in tobacco markets um, and then for me I think there's probably three just big learnings um, accountability so if we're using this as a hypothecation um, we need to make sure that this the smoke-free legislation and the smoke-free ambition continues to get the money. So we need to make sure that this is just an, isn't a scheme that the money isn't raised year on year. So we need some review against objectives. Are we raising the money we want? Is it the health select committee or is it the public accounts committee? Um, Thinking about parallel imports. Parallel imports is, was a, uh, is a big thing uh, in pharmaceutical markets, especially after the devalu devaluation of the pound we saw after Brexit. Uh, in tobacco, you'll see smuggling. Think about that early on, because that's a big element of the spend. Um, and publish and publicise is my is my sort of big wish here. Tell people where the money's coming from and the transparency on the sales and marketing uh, spend of tobacco companies, I think will be uh, very helpful. And that's all Thank for you. me. It's running Thank over. You. Thank you very much indeed, Henry. That's uh, very interesting. And I'm sure colleagues will have some questions that uh, they may like to ask in the Q&A a little bit later on. Um, we're moving straight on now to Professor Linda Bold, who is a director of the Spectrum cons Consortium. Uh, she's a behavioural scientist and has worked with Cancer Research UK and is a former government advisor on tobacco control, scientific advisor. So we're very privileged to have her with us this morning and I hand over to her now. Thank you very much, Chair. Vicky, could you share my slides as well? That worked quite well for Henry's presentation, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. And so uh, thank you very much for inviting me. And I'm just going to let you know initially about Spectrum and then I'll move on to focusing on what we need to do. And um, so the first slide, Vicky, thanks. Next one. Um, so just to, in case any of you have not heard of this consortium, this is the successor to the UK Centre for Tobacco and Alcohol Studies that I, I think many of you will know. Um, we're now uh, beyond our 10th year of collaboration across many universities. And the key change with Spectrum, which is funded by the UK Prevention Partnership, is that the public health agencies, Public Health Scotland, Wales and Public Health England, are part of our consortium. And crucially, so is the Smoke Free Action Coalition, along with the Alcohol Health Alliance, the Obesity Health Alliance and other key partners. Um, so you'll be hearing more from us in the coming years. Next slide. 
So just in terms of the UK's place in tobacco control, we are, as the minister was saying, and others, a global leader, and we don't want to lose our position um, at the top of the leaderboard because let's not forget, we had the highest rates of smoking in the world, um, and we now have some of the lowest, certainly, uh, in Europe other than Sweden. Um, so I'm just going to run through where we are briefly and then emphasise, as the minister has already, uh, the importance of reducing smoking pregnancy, where we're perhaps making less progress, and then crucially, low cost um, and other evidence-based interventions. Next slide. Um, so you all know where we are now from the annual population survey. We're down to 14% of uh, people aged over 18 um, in the UK, which is fantastic progress. And um, that varies in terms of the devolved nations. England is ahead of the rest of the UK. Um, but as you know, the inequalities, although not shown on the slide, are substantial. Uh, almost one in five smoke amongst routine and manual groups, and that's two and a half times higher than those in professional and managerial groups. Um, next slide. Perhaps the most encouraging thing we've seen is that uh, young adults appear to have reduced their smoking rates more quickly than other age groups. Um, uh, really a 10 percentage point drop amongst 18 to 24 year olds between 2011 and this last year. And the highest smoking rates are still in those aged 25 to 34, around 19 percent. So great progress, and I think the progress in the young is heartening. Um, On to the next slide. I think arguably um, we've made more progress in youth prevention, as a recent Royal College of Physicians report that Tessa and I were involved in highlights, than adult cessation. It's um, much more effective to focus on prevention than cure, but we need both, as we were so movingly hearing from Sue at the beginning. So you'll see here that youth prevention didn't happen by accident. It happened because we changed the environment in which young people were taking up or not smoking. And I think as we look to post recovery build back better for COVID, um, prevention is going to be key and investment of that in that is going to be key. And I'm sure we're beginning to see a greater understanding around obesity and implementing some of these environmental and policy changes that we've already implemented in tobacco. So youth prevention is a success story. Um, but as we were hearing from Bob Blackman at the beginning, let's not be complacent. We still have 200,000 children who start smoking every year. Next, uh, next slide. Um, here's the area where I think we need to continue to focus among others. So this is an area that I've done a lot of research in over the years in trials and, and observational studies. And this slide just shows you where we need to get to to reach the 2022 target of 6%. We're well away from that. And although smoking at, at uh, delivery, as it's measured in England, has declined, that decline has been very gradual. And the inequalities uh, around England and across the UK are substantial. Substantial. So we have a long way to go here. And the next slide just shows you the regional variation among sustainability and transformation partnerships in England. I'm sorry you can't see the detail, but effectively what this highlights is that the only STPs that are near the 6% prevalence target are those in London. And we have uh, a long way to go in many other parts of the country, but there's some great work underway that I will highlight. So what do we need to do next, focusing on next steps? So I'm going to set out as the uh, roadmap does very uh, concisely. First of all, the things that we should do that are low cost, <clears throat> they really require almost no investment, but they do require regulation. So the first one is pattern inserts, which seems a small thing, but um, evidence shows from, from Canada, a country that I'm uh, still advising Health Canada on their tobacco control strategies. Uh, Canada introduced pack inserts a number of years ago, and basically they're a card inside the pack, so that every time the smoker opens a new pack of cigarettes, they receive these messages which rotate, and crucially they provide information about where to access support to quit. Crawford Moody, my colleague and others, have done good work, including in the UK, looking at pack inserts, showing that um, support for them among smokers is remarkably high, actually, um, and they also prompt uh, increasing motivation to quit and to consider making another quit attempt. Um, so though a small change, they will make a difference. And also moving on to raising the age of sale, a policy that in the past, even those of us in tobacco control perhaps didn't view as central, but when we raised uh, the age of smoking uh, in terms of purchasing from 16 to 18, we saw actually an impact on youth smoking rates. And if we could increase that to 21, 
that would make a difference. And we've seen that from other jurisdictions. And in the most uh, recent ASH YouGov survey, 2020, I was given these data just yesterday, 82% of adults support making um, support uh, raising the age of sale uh, for uh, younger people. And also um, just thinking about the fact that that may contribute uh, to delaying the point at which young people become smokers. And we know that most people who take up smoking still do so uh, before the age of 21, the vast, vast majority. So this is a critical period and we have an opportunity to intervene and it has strong public support. Next slide. And other low cost things we should be doing that are in the roadmap, one that is not being given the attention perhaps it merits is menthol. So as you'll know, through the European Tobacco Products Directive, we implemented a menthol ban on cigarettes and other tobacco products in May of this year. And that's for the reasons that a lot of smokers believe menthol is healthier. We also know um, that related to the product, the use of menthol relaxes the airways and crucially it makes tobacco more palatable. And that is important for initiation of smoking. So what we've seen now is a removal of those products, but we still have an opportunity for people to access menthol um, through, uh, you, particularly for those who use roll, their own tobacco, which is a substantial group. Um, so we need to think about these other products that are still on sale that contribute to what people use when they're accessing tobacco and still have menthol in them. So that's a small but important change we could make. And then also on this slide, an additional measure would be strengthening smoke-free uh, restrictions. So this uh, chart just shows you one example from Greater Manchester in terms of work they did there to look at public support for extending smoke-free areas. And specifically, I'm talking here about children's playgrounds where the support in Greater Manchester was 83%, schools and nurseries, for example, um, access to grounds and the buildings, 86%, GP surgeries and hospital grounds, 62% support, and I mean strengthening it. Um, and then also other areas like outdoor public events, um, supermarket car parts, et cetera. This actually isn't rocket science. There are a number of jurisdictions around the world that already mandate these areas to smoke free. Again, there is strong public support for it. And um, so we can consider that. And then moving on to think about um, some things that do require investment, but from my perspective are backed up by solid evidence from high quality studies including those done in the UK. So I think everybody knows that mass media spend for a variety of reasons has declined substantially in recent years, um, but we mustn't forget the importance of campaigns. And this slide here is actually from analysis that Tessa and team did in England, uh, a little bit old, but it just showed in the days where we had the central office for information, their spend on mass media tobacco control campaigns and the direct and measurable relationship between calls to the smoking helpline in those days. And nowadays it would also be indicators like accessing online support to quit. So this, these data are not unique to England. We see that from other countries, Australia, US. If you invest in mass media, it prompts quit attempts and prompts uh, support to stop. And then just a couple of other evidence-based interventions I want to highlight the importance of continuing to invest in stop smoking services, which have been hugely badly affected by cuts to local authority public health. In the era of COVID, I think there is a, um, and even just listening to my colleagues giving evidence to the Health and Social Care Committee yesterday, uh, we really need to have a serious public discussion about how we strengthen our public health infrastructure going forward, not just for health protection and infection control, but also for uh, non-communicable disease prevention. And that includes stop smoking services. And e-cigarettes, of course, vaping, um, you know, of, of which uh, I, I and others have done many studies that show uh, vaping does help people quit, um, can add to the mix. And uh, I think if we can support primary care and stop smoking services to encourage people to smoke, to switch completely from vaping to smoking, that has a role. And of course, vaping itself bears no cost to the public purse. Uh, next slide. Just a couple more slides, almost finished. Um, the other point, as the minister was saying, is thinking about pregnancy and there Greater Manchester provides an excellent um, example of what you can do. We are evaluating their system-wide program, smoke-free pregnancy, 
program, which of course also includes incentives, where I and others did a large randomized control trial that showed that incentives for smoking cessation in pregnancy, even modest incentives are effective. So we need to think about this approach more widely across the country. And then just thinking about enforcement. So we know that um, trading standards has a hugely important role to play in reducing the affordability of tobacco, because by enforcing age of sale laws, uh, this makes getting access to cheap tobacco uh, much uh, harder for young people. And that's not just uh, addressing um, sales in areas where tobacco shouldn't be sold to young people, but also the crucial role that trading standards have in addressing illicit tobacco with other partners. And of course, the Northeast, and I know Ilsa Rutter is here, has been a great example of what you can do in terms of a region-wide approach to tackling illicit tobacco. But funding for local trading standards fell from uh, 213 million in 2010 to 124 million in 2016. And we must not forget the crucial role that trading standards have to play in comprehensive tobacco control. And then just last two slides, um, just to emphasize uh, the importance of regional working. Again, in, in the current time, I think we've seen the importance of a local public health response, but regional offices for tobacco control have been a key part of England's success in recent decades. And of course, sadly, what we've seen is the closure of a number of regional offices, with FRESH being the remainder, but even there, their funding is under threat, and we need to fight to make sure that FRESH continues its excellent work. So they are an outstanding example, in my view, of how you can include and develop social marketing campaigns and mass media when national spend is down. You can generate intelligence for local trading standards, and you can reduce comfort levels uh, through direct approaches to the public and to others around illicit tobacco. And um, so we have a lot to learn from Fresh, but we must try and remember the importance of regional infrastructure for tobacco control as part of the roadmap. And finally, as we've already heard from Henry, and I won't go back through the details because he explained them very well, in an era, era where we're all entering into what will be a hugely challenging uh, time for everyone in the UK, families, communities and government trying to find a way to leverage income resources to pay for crucial prevention activities, I think is key. And a polluters pay, polluter pays approach, I think is an evidence-based um, and uh, feasible a way to do this. So I think if we can all work together to try and argue for that um, and make sure that it progresses, uh, I think the UK again could be an international leader in trying to leverage this investment for prevention. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank, you, thank, you, thank you very much indeed, Linda. That last, that last uh, slide is a particularly powerful one, I think, and uh, one that we, we, we will be coming back to a number of times. Uh, if anybody have got any questions that they'd ask, like to ask any of the speakers, can they please put them on the, on the chats function now? And we'll try to take as many of, of those as we can in the Q&A we, we're coming to a little bit later. Uh, our final speaker is uh, Dr. Tessa Langley from the University of Nottingham. Uh, she's an associate professor of the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences, and I won't delay any time more by going straight over to her now. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to try and share my slides. Okay, hopefully you can see those now. So I'm going to talk about the economic impact of smoking on society and in particular in households in the poorest communities in the UK and hopefully show you that ending smoking really is important to reducing health and economic inequalities um, in the UK um, and in particular in the face of COVID increasing resilience in those uh, poorest communities where the health and economic well-being has really been badly affected by COVID and, and will continue to, to be so for some time. So here, here's an overview of the things that I'm going to touch on. Um, and a lot of these are things which have been touched on by the previous speakers already. So firstly, just looking at the, the cost of smoking to the UK economy, this is something which is very well documented at the population level. So we know that smoking kills half of long-term smokers, it causes disease and disability 
both among smokers themselves and in individuals who are exposed to secondhand smoke. So those health effects are very, very well documented. But those health effects also translate to economic costs. Um, and those economic costs are very often borne by wider society, not just by the smokers themselves. So particularly in terms of the financial burden on the healthcare system and the social care system, and in terms of, of productivity. Uh, these are some of the, the most recent estimates, and I won't go through these in detail, but as you can see, these are very, very substantial costs um, at, the, at the population level, both in terms of treatment costs, productivity, social care, and also costs like the cost of, of fires caused by, caused by smoking. Smoking is a huge source of inequalities in the UK, and this is what I'm going to mainly talk about in this in this presentation. Uh, starting in terms of looking at smoking prevalence between different population groups, this is something which has been very well documented. We know that smoking is concentrated in disadvantaged groups. It has been over time, and that isn't that isn't changing. So even though we've seen decreases in smoking prevalence um, across the population, these gaps in smoking prevalence and inequalities in smoking prevalence uh, between uh, the, the best off and the worst off uh, in the population, those, those are still there and aren't really changing. We haven't really seen much of a narrowing of the gap. So this here is focusing on economic uh, disadvantage. So you can see that people in routine and manual groups are much more likely to be, uh, be smokers. So those differences in, um, in smoking prevalence, of course, translates to huge differences in morbidity and mortality. And we know that smoking is a huge contributor to health inequality. It's one of the most important, if not the greatest source of health, uh, health inequality in the, in the population. And it's not just um, in terms of socioeconomic status. So here's another example looking at smoking and inequalities in relation to mental health. So people with a mental health condition are much more likely to be smokers than uh, individuals in the, uh, in the general population. And again, we can see there's been some decline in smoking prevalence in individuals with a mental health condition. Um, but there is hu still huge disparity in terms of smoking prevalence, which again will will translate to disparities in terms of uh, the, the health effects of smoking in the longer term. So we know that the health effects of smoking and the impact of smoking on health inequalities have been uh, uh, well studied, that's well recognized, and it's one of the, the, the main reasons for intervening in, uh, in the tobacco market and trying to get people to stop smoking. So those are well recognized problems. But tobacco use also exacerbates poverty. And this is really a consequence of smoking that's often overlooked. So uh, policy is generally implemented with a view to reducing the, the, the differential in, in health effects of smoking and to reduce the differences in smoking prevalence. Um, but uh, tobacco use really exacerbates poverty because People who smoke are smoking a huge, uh, spending a huge amount of money on tobacco products. So on average, uh, a recent estimate suggested that current smokers are spending about £23 on smoking each week. Of course, that will vary depending on uh, who it is, what they're, what they're smoking. Uh, some, some smokers may be spending slightly less if they're cheap, uh, spending cheaper products. But whichever way you look at this, um, particularly disadvantaged smokers, people on low incomes are likely to be spending a, quite a substantial proportion of their income on, um, on tobacco. And that expenditure has the potential to crowd out expenditure on other essential items, possibly food, housing, uh, those, those types of things. And in Nottingham, we've done a little bit of work on this to try and understand the impact of smoking on poverty in terms of its, its financial uh, impact. So the figure on the, the top left here shows you the, the median expenditure on tobacco uh, in different income groups. Uh, so uh, one there is the, the lowest income group. And, and you can see there that there is a lower expenditure on tobacco in that population group. But then when you look at the bottom right, 
and you look at the proportion of weekly income that is, is spent on tobacco in those groups, um, among the, the people in the low income group, the proportion spent on uh, tobacco among smokers is, is much higher than it is in high income groups and really accounts for quite a substantial proportion of, of total, total income. So this is potentially uh, a, a, a big, big problem in that this is, this is money that these people could maybe be reallocating to, to other things um, that won't be, won't be so harmful. Um, to tell you a little bit more about the, the work that we've done on this, so we've estimated based on uh, population level data that 23% of UK households in relative po poverty purchase tobacco, that's pretty much in line with the, the data that we see on, on smoking prevalence in, in that population. Um, and we need to think not just about the people who are actually in relative poverty, but the impact on people who are um, just above the poverty line, who are spending a substantial amount of uh, money on tobacco. And we've estimated that if you um, subtract from uh, the income in those households, the expenditure on tobacco, and then recalculate their, their kind of effective income um, following tobacco expenditure, about 230,000 additional households would be defined as living in relative poverty. So we can see a huge financial impact on these, on these households. And then finally, so I've been talking about the, the differences um, in tobacco use between uh, different populations, um, so within, within regions, but we also see substantial variation in tobacco use uh, between between regions and what that means is that the health and economic consequences of smoking will be concentrated in the regions where smoking prevalence is highest and those are typically the most deprived regions because that is where smoking smoking prevalence of smoking is is most common just want to make a final point so uh, around the cost effectiveness of some of the interventions that are needed to try and reduce smoking prevalence in those populations. So Linda touched on the effectiveness of some of these policies that um, do have an upfront cost. But it's important to keep in mind that tobacco control interventions have been shown to offer very good value for money. Um, what that looks like varies a little bit depending on whether you look at the, the up, just the upfront costs and effects or the longer term consequences, because of course tobacco control interventions affect health outcomes a, a long way down the line in the future. So often we have to look at the long term to, to see cost savings, but even in the shorter term, um, uh, individual level smoking cessation treatments have been found to have uh, a low cost per quality adjusted life year. Um, Mass media campaigns, when we look at the long run, are often cost saving once we te take into account the fact that they, they save money on, on healthcare costs, for example, in the future. So even though they can be associated with a relatively high upfront cost, the long term, uh, the, the, the long term um, shows that they are cost saving. And then finally, tobacco tax increases, which are, have, been, have been frequently shown to be the most effective tobacco control intervention, typically increase government revenue. So to sum up then, we know that most smokers want to quit and as we've already heard, it's very difficult to do. Smoking is addictive and smoking cessation is challenging. And we really need to focus on low income and other disadvantaged groups who are particularly vulnerable to the negative consequences of tobacco addiction. Um, that's where smoking prevalence is very highly concentrated and those groups also suffer economic effects as well as the, the well-documented health effects. So it's really important for us to keep tap tackling smoking with a view to reducing that substantial economic burden on the NHS, on social care and on businesses, to reduce health inequalities, to reduce the financial burden that smoking places on um, low-income households, and finally, to make a contribution to reducing health and economic inequalities um, between as well as within the UK regions. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Tessa. I'm afraid we've only got about 10 or slightly less than 15 minutes um, for, the, uh, for the questions and answers. 
uh, and I suspect there'll be quite a lot of subjects which people wanted to, to, to raise uh, well after the meeting. But we'll take what we can. I'd like to start with my colleague, uh, Baroness Glennis Thornton, who I have to say works harder in the House of Lords than almost anybody else I know. So, Glennis, would you like to ask your question? Deborah, OK, if, if Lady Thornton's not with us, Deborah, can you ask it for her? Yes, I, I, I will. Um, the question is, um, let me just get that up. Can I ask about UK compliance with the EU Pro Tobacco Products Directive after Brexit um, and or UN um, EHO obligations? Um, and who is responsible for this in, in government? And Alison Walker from DHSC, you responded on the chat. Could you give the answer on the um, uh, to the audience as a whole? Sorry about that. I didn't manage to unmute myself in time. Thank you, Deborah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, thank you. That's it. Well, that's why I wrote that's, it down. You know. That's the question. OK. <laughs> um, Al and Alison, are you still on the call? Yes, I'm still here. Yeah. Hi, Deborah. Um, um, sorry. Yeah, no, go ahead. <laughs> so um, the government's making the necessary fixing changes to the tobacco and related product regulations 2016 to ensure that tobacco control regulations do continue to function from the 1st of January and obviously to reflect what was agreed in the withdrawal agreement and the Northern Ireland protocol um, and DHSC are taking the lead on this. OK, thank you. Um, Lord Reynard has asked a question to which there's an easy answer, and that is, is it possible to have copies of the presentations? And the answer is they'll all be put online with the recording. And I understand the, the PDFs are going to be circulated as well. Deborah, can you confirm that? Yes, definitely. OK, and uh, Lord Reynard, is there anything else you want to ask while, you're, while, while we have you with, with us? Oh, Chris, you'll have to put it on the chat again, I'm afraid. OK, we'll pick it up on the chat. Um, there's some questions about um, the polluter pays argument. Uh, and I think, Deborah, you had a, you had a point about where does the money go and can we be sure that it goes to where we want it to go? Do you want to elaborate a little bit on that? Well, just really, I wanted Henry to, to, to sort of explain why it's different from a tax and how it um, uh, and how that would work. Yeah, so um, so tax is, is trying to control demand. OK, and we're trying to make it more expensive for people. So people uh, think before that they, um, uh, they they purchase tobacco, whereas what we're proposing, this is a, a, su a supply side uh, control. They talk about it in economics. And we know that um, uh, pharma, uh, uh, tobacco companies are highly, highly profitable. It's because they're displaying market power. And it's that market power that we're trying to go to attacking the profitability, very specific of tobacco companies in the same way that we do it for pharmaceutical companies because of the patent protection. Um, so there's different. So it's, it's a very specific um, uh, measure as opposed to tax, which is broad, it impacts everyone, or corporation tax, for example. So it's a way of, um, it's, it's a, think of it as an additional corporation tax, uh, specifically on tobacco companies. Um, and is the Department of Health the, the right place to run this? Um, yeah, they've got all the world's experts that have been doing the PPRS for the last 50 odd years, yes. Um, I, there is a huge amount of expertise in there uh, and understanding the way that um, uh, companies operate the uh, annual financial returns. I mean, um, I, I think there is a huge amount of it. Um, I think I said on my reply, why re recreate the wheel? Um, uh, and I think that's the, the, probably the best place to sit at, at least in the, uh, at least in the interim. And if there's a public health and public education programme, Fund, which is going to be funded from this money. It has to be run by the Department of Health. Uh, it would be disastrous if it went into the Treasury. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, that, that should be a, a key thing. And I, I think this is what we learned in, in the pharmaceutical pr uh, price scheme is that the money didn't go back to healthcare. It went originally back to the, tre the Treasury. You want it and you can, you can actually be quite hard in terms of the hypothecation. This is what it's going to fund. Yeah, exactly right. I've got a question from Sarah McFadden from Asthma UK and British Lung Foundation. Sarah, are you with us? Would you like to ask a question? If not, I'll ask it for you. 
Uh, she says she's interested in whether there is any insight yet on the effectiveness of digital stop smoking interventions as face to face support has been on hold and is likely to be for some time to come. Who'd like to answer that one? So I can I can answer it, but uh, others may even to ch ch chip in. I, I actually wrote an answer to her. Uh, there's strong evidence for text based uh, messaging, so mobile phone and health interventions for cessation. There's less evidence for people looking at websites, for example, but some promising evidence. Where I expect there to be more studies is on virtual behavioral support. So a smoker seeing um, a, a trained advisor in the way we're interacting now, which of course we're rolling out uh, in primary care at scale. Um, so I, I think this is the way forward. We just need to accept that this is how we're going to need to operate. And I would, um, even with gaps in evidence, I think it's an area where we can be confident we should uh, invest more. Tessa, do you want to add anything? Sorry, just trying to rush rush to unmute. Uh, no, I, d I don't have anything anything else to add. Um, although uh, I was I've been doing some work with colleagues here in Nottingham looking at uh, vape shops and the potential for vape shops in supporting smoking cessation interventions and that I suppose there, there are potential avenues there in terms of virtual support as well and I'm sure a lot of that has been happening during lockdown as well so that might be something interesting to, to look at. Thanks Tessa. I think we've still got Alex Morris with us. Um, no I think Alex has, Alex has just had to leave unfortunately. Ah, uh, you we'll check my question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Um, we've got a question from Brian Turner. Um, is Brian with us still? Yes, I am. Yeah. Hi. Go ahead. Go ahead. Ask your question. Yeah, hi. Yeah, hopefully the, uh, the group are aware of the primary care networks here in, in Sussex. We have established them and we've got people into post as chair and clinical directors, although COVID has uh, drawn their activity to uh, a dead halt. Uh, but I still think they are actually, although they've been charged with reducing health inequalities, I think they're still very, very unsure about how they're going to go about doing this. And I wonder if they need a more secure footing. So I do think that smoking should be the first project they should all get their teeth into. Uh, in West Sussex, I think we're, we're a bit of a forerunner. Other parts of the country have still got another 12 months to establish their PCNs. But I think we'd like to show some good practice from Sussex. And I'd like some, some guidance from the APPG and how we can get them effectively moving. Could I come in there, Chris? Just to say that we've been we're really interested to hear from you. And um, Ash has been doing some work on primary care networks and ideas for what they can do. We've been talking to NHS England, so we'd be very happy to get back to you with our ideas because I, it sounds like we could work um, uh, to support you on that. Would that be helpful? Thank you. That would be terrific. So I'm really optimistic about the future of PCNs. I think they can be effective and showing some community leadership in, uh, in health inequalities locally. If we get the right people on them and the right projects and the right way of uh, right communication strategy for them. Thank you, Brad. Um, I'm going to ask a question from to our, to our friends from the Northwest, who I know are on the line. Um, you will probably have seen that uh, your experience in persuading all 11 local authorities in, in the Manchester area to support the proposal for um, a, a restriction on smoking for pavement, where li licenses are given for pa pavement operations, um, was, was unanimous. Was unanimous. Can you can you say how it is you managed to get such support, and what are the lessons that other areas can learn from? I don't know, I don't know who'd like to ask. Uh, who'd like to answer that? But as I say, no, I know that the Northwest is, is represented on the call. Hi, Richard. It's Andrea. I hoped. I hoped it was Andrea. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> it's nice to talk to you. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, in Greater Manchester, we've um, been working on this um, over the past few years, and certainly um, there's a really strong appetite for more smoke-free spaces. Um, and in fact, eight in 10 people in Greater Manchester want to see us make smoking history. Um, and we've committed to do that by 2027. Um, we do see more smoke-free spaces as being an essential part of that, and we are really disappointed um, that um, we don't have that commitment um, from Monday, uh, that all 
uh, areas across the country um, will have to impose that condition on pavement licences. In Greater Manchester, uh, Manchester City Council have already made that commitment and the other nine local authorities um, you know, will be looking at that because they've um, made that decision. Uh, in terms of uh, why, uh, we did do that consultation with the public when we published our strategy in 2017. Um, so yes, public consultation engagement was part of that. Um, but I think we've just reached that tipping point. Um, you know, the majority of people don't smoke. Um, and, you know, I think it just makes sense um, for us to move forward with more smoke free spaces. Um, and to uh, ensure that we don't um, allow people to, uh, you know, kind of move back on the space that we're in. Yes, I, I imagine everybody was as depressed as I was when I saw that uh, Forrest had welcomed the outcome of the uh, decision in the Lords on Monday. I, I mean, I, I, I instinctively feel if Forrest supports something, it's very hard for me to support it. And I think that probably goes for most people on this call this morning. Um, Deborah, is it feasible, do you think, for the Manchester example, the Greater Manchester example, to be followed by all local government association members? I, I think it is, and we are in discussion with the LGA, um, and there are other councils um, that have been very strong on this, and I know that um, Councillor Paulette Hamilton is on the call uh, from Birmingham, um, who is also vice chair of the, the LGA Community Wellbeing Board, so I don't know if um, Paulette would like to, to comment on that. I know Newcastle are very interested in that too. Paulette, I'd love to hear from you. I quoted you in the debate on Monday. Oh. If you can unmute, then we'd love to hear from you. I think Paulette's still on. Um, I don't know if anyone can confirm. If not, we can um, liaise with Paulette later. I, I, she's got her hand up on my screen. <laughs> OK. Wait a second. Yeah, she's she's on, but she's muted. So if she could unmute, then she can then she can do, then she can come in. Now, well, now uh, we'll wait. Yes. Um, Paulette's muted at her end and we don't have the option to unmute, um, unfortunately. Um, so if she is unable to unmute, let's continue that conversation separately because I think it's a really important one and the role of the LGA on this has been absolutely excellent. Yes, as indeed has the Welsh Government, I think. Yes. The Welsh Government, the Welsh government are going down this, this route as well. Um, we're almost out of time. Can I just ask if anybody else... What, Yes, I'm, we've got a we've got a um, a chat message from Paulette which says I'm Paulette Hamilton from Birmingham, and we have also supported the license. Excellent. Um, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Is there anybody else, anybody else who would like to come in with a comment or a question in the last uh, in the last few moments of the, of the call? If not, Deborah, do you want do you want to, do you want to have a last word? Um, well, just very briefly, I'd like to thank the APPG um, for hosting this and for supporting the roadmap to a Smoke Free 2030. I'd like to thank all the speakers whose contributions were excellent, and particularly Sue for speaking from a very personal place. Um, and to say that we will be carrying on and moving this forward. I think the energy that there is in behind what is, a, a, you know, isn't a party political issue, the desire to end smoking has been shown by um, uh, the debate in the Lords this week. Um, and we will get there with the support of everyone on this call or all those outside of here um, who so strongly support this as well. And we're there to support you all. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Deborah. I think it's fair to say, if, and I can say on behalf, on behalf of all my parliamentary colleagues in both houses, that the work that Ash does in this area and keeping us informed and alert, alerting us to issues, it's absolutely invaluable. 
And uh, I don't think the All Party Group could function, frankly, if we weren't able to be able to count on your expertise and your support. And the fact that you are able to attract front bench health ministers uh, from both parties to an, an event like this is an, ind is an indication of just how well respected Ash is. And I'm sure that uh, you will go from strength to strength, as you have done over the last uh, 20 years or so that I've been involved. And I think that's the, probably the very last word, which is to thank both the Public Health Minister and her shadow opposite number. Um, uh, I think we heard just how, how clearly from them um, how important this is um, right across Parliament as an objective we can all struggle to achieve. Yes. Lord although, Lord although it, yes. Sorry, it's Councillor Hamilton from Birmingham. Oh, I, have never, I have never known equipment like this. I just have been trying to speak for about 10 minutes. Can I just quickly say the LGA absolutely supported that um, that policy that went through the Lords on Monday. Um, we spoke all over the country because we feel it is the right way to go um, with the licence and I was truly disappointed that it didn't get through. But can I also say to this meeting that Birmingham City Council is fully behind the policy that um, people have to get pavement licensing and if they do, they don't smoke um, if they want the licensing. So Birmingham has also supported supported it. So can I say that was something that I truly believed in and, I, and I'm just really sorry that it didn't get through. But the LGA are absolutely with the, the councils that support the LGA behind what you're trying to do. So thank you. Sorry about my, my equipment. I just couldn't get in. Paulette, Paulette that, was, that was worth waiting for, more than I can say. And I can tell you that the, um, the supporters of the amendment were almost unanimous on, on Monday. Um, everybody who spoke, I think, bar two, wanted, wanted, wanted to see our amendment go through, but I'm afraid there was a, an agreement between the front benches of the Labour and the Conservative Party to, to do something else. But um, it's not the last word, and the fact that you and the LGA as a whole are going to be able to make it possible for the license issuing to be conditional on a, on a smoke-free requirement, I think means we will get there in the end, although not quite as easily as we would have done. But thank you very much indeed. And I'm so pleased you joined the, joined the call and we we're able to hear from you. I think at this point, I'm going to close the meeting. Thank everybody for coming. I endorse what uh, Deborah said about the quality of our speakers. Uh, and I'd like to say how much I, I appreciated what uh, Sue Mantle said at the beginning which I thought set the, set, set the scene really well for us. And our, ex, and our expert, uh, expert academics, if I can call you that, uh, have really given us a lot to think about, and I look forward to seeing the slides. But meanwhile, thank you all very much for coming, and I hope we can, uh, we can do this again before very long. There's a lot more we need to do on this subject. Thank you.